Thank you. Thank you very much, Sarah. And a warm welcome to you all uh, to the first of uh, this series and to the series uh, itself. This is the, uh, an important uh, kind of moment for us. It's, it's important to emphasise the collaboration that there is between uh, ourselves at the DPC and the Software Preservation Network in organising this uh, series. And I, I really want to start really with a, with a vote of thanks uh, to, to Jessica, to Sarah, uh, and also to Paul, who have been leading uh, the planning for the, the whole series. We're going to hear from them as the, the, the presentations uh, continue. Uh, let me, uh, you know, say we've got six webinars uh, in the series to come. We're going to record them all. We're going to have, therefore, a great set of resources uh, at the end of this. Our purpose in organising this uh, uh, series is not so much for a series of presentations, so much as for the opportunity for the conversation. So we really do want to encourage the dialogue, we do want to encourage participation uh, in all of these uh, events. I would say, to emphasise what Sarah says, we uh, at the DPC have been running webinars for, for quite a few years now, but actually this is our first adventure in Zoom, uh, having previously relied on WebEx for all our services, so be patient with us as we as we work at the technology, and there are very many participants. So it's a, a warm, warm welcome uh, uh, to you all. Let me say something about the complex topic that we have uh, in front of us. So it seems to me that the digital preservation community began its life to some extent with a, a, a dialogue about emulation uh, or migration. And for, for you know early years of digital preservation presented that as a theoretical discussion, but I think myself and my experience and other agencies really focused our efforts on the migration element of that work. But obviously over the last couple of years, the technologies and tools around uh, uh, software, uh, around emulation, around virtualization have changed tremendously. And that allows us to perhaps reopen a discussion which was perhaps parked for pragmatic reasons uh, in the, maybe the early uh, 2000s. We find ourselves now at a time where data is more complicated, more uh, abundant, uh, and more in demand than it has ever been. And if that's the case, it seems to me that the boundary between software and data and application are, are really, uh, really beginning to merge and become really unclear to the point where I'm no longer really clear where data begins and software uh, ends. So it's, it's wonderful to be uh, kind of moving on the digital preservation uh, dialogue with this very thoughtful but also practical and insightful collaboration between ourselves at the DPC and the, the Software Preservation Network. This webinar, uh, this episode in the series, was, is designed to set the scene. So it's going to give us a bit of an introduction to, to software preservation and present to us a series of themes and challenges which I'm sure uh, will lead to not just discussion now, but discussion throughout uh, the, the, the series itself. And of course, as a collaboration and as something of an experiment, we're very focused and very interested to know what participants make uh, of what we're doing. And indeed, if there are suggestions and, and, and proposals from the floor, then you know we're all ears uh, for that. So welcome to the series uh, and welcome to this episode. Before I go any further, Jess, I wonder if I could bring you in for a moment to welcome on behalf of the Software Preservation Network, uh, uh, the work that you're, uh, the participants on your side. Thank you so much, William. Yeah, to reiterate, um, you know, just huge gratitude to everyone in attendance today, to everyone for registering and being excited about the series with us. Um, I would like to take a moment to recognize uh, our colleagues in the training and education group of the Software Preservation Network that helped to do the, um, alongside uh, Paul and Sarah, engage with the research. And then you'll, you'll be introduced to um, uh, Elizabeth, uh, Andy, and Anne-Marie later on in the series as they'll be your research and facilitation leads for some of the subsequent episodes. But I just want to give, um, you know, an explicit and public shout out to uh, Andy and Anne-Marie and Elizabeth for their preparation in the series and also to Dana 
Neil and Sherry, who are members of that group, and help to provide peer review and suggestions for improvement on the content of the episodes. And again, uh, thank you to all of you. You're what is making the magic happen here. So uh, to William's point about discussion, we hope that this can engage everyone and, and we'll be able to narrow in on some topics that are of particular interest to all of you. Thank you very much, uh, Jess. So let's let's get ourselves moving a little bit into towards the episode. I mean, why are we why are we we doing this? Why is it important to the, the DPC? You know, some of you will have attended the DPC unconference every year. We have a, a, a you know a free for all to some extent, an agendaless meeting where people are invited to add any topic uh, to the mix. And I think consistently for the last two or three years, software preservation has been on that list. Uh, and as always, the DPC asks itself the question, you know, how can we help our members with this topic? What can we do uh, that would support them in this complex uh, emergent issue uh, of software preservation? And, and really, the webinars are a response uh, to that articulation and also to, uh, to recognise the great work of the Software Preservation Network too. So we have six uh, in the schedule. We have introduction today, but we're move, going to move on to software collection uh, development, to software uh, reuse and use cases, uh, to software and digital uh, scholarly communications, to scaling preservation, uh, and also to the legal challenges associated uh, with software preservation, some of which we've just heard uh, a brief dialogue about from Jason. So I'm looking forward to your input into that uh, in particular, uh, uh, Jason. Uh, to get the series going, though, it's a great pleasure to hand over to Paul Wheatley. Paul will be no stranger to you all at the DPC, but Paul's background, uh, and perhaps even your own introduction, Paul, into digital preservation was through the, the, the now uh, famous uh, Doomsday Project. I guess if you knew 20 years ago how much that would still be uh, uh, recognized by people in the community, uh, you'd be amazed, but it's uh, very much a kind of a, a, a flagship project in digital preservation. Uh, and it's a pleasure, therefore, Paul, to hand over to you to get us going uh, with our discussion on software preservation. Thanks very much, William. Um, so I'm just going to try and set the scene a little bit here and zip through a brief history of software preservation. It certainly won't be exhaustive, but I'm going to try and give a bit of a flavour of some of the different approaches, some of the different facets, some of the different perspectives that we've seen over the last 30 years in this field. If you'd like to dig a little bit deeper, by the end of the week, we'll be sending out some complimentary materials along with a recording of this webinar. And that will include a lovely bibliography by our SPIM colleagues and a few other bits and pieces, including a not to miss video from Jason Scott. So this was a really interesting paper to go back to, all the way back to the beginning. And this quote certainly catches the eye many years after it was first written. It's not quite true anymore, depending on a definition or interpretation of some of the key words here, but only just. It's quite stunning how slow we have been to preserve a defining story of the IT revolution, and I think a defining story of our time. Doran Swade of UK Science Museum and Different Edge and Fame reinforces Berman's point further. He uses the phrase growing alarm, and this still hasn't come into effect some 25 years later. Certainly in the UK, we're yet to properly bridge a real gap between archives and the museum sector, and that gap is software preservation. So we've clearly still got a long way to go, but of course it's not all bad news, and we've mostly been making progress since those early years. So some of the earliest practical work mentioned briefly there by uh, William in this field was the Chameleon Project's examination of emulation as a preservation approach and its demonstration work to rescue an early multimedia system called BBC Doomsday. Chameleon really helped to address a lot of the scepticism around emulation and the need to preserve software that was prevalent at the time in the library and archival communities. Because, hey, emulation has been whirring away pretty nicely and pretty usefully since almost the dawn of computer science. Chameleon also illustrated the impact of leveraging existing enthusiast developed emulation technology. So I'm yet to feature the last member of the Glam Club, 
galleries seem to have been much more forward thinking than many. And I guess there's a natural progression from installation and interactive art to the interactive digital. I recall reading about the Variable Media Initiative while I was working on Chameleon and being struck by the parallels with our digital work at that time. And this project went on to become the Variable Media Network and acted as a catalyst for subsequent progress. So that's our community, but who was seriously and comprehensively collecting software back in those days? It is, of course, the enthusiasts. This is just one example from the great home computing era of the 1980s. As well as collecting, there has been an incredible amount of emulator development, and much of all this enthusiast work was, of course, focused on computer games. So by chance, uh, when I was putting together this presentation, I, I came across this ridiculously generic Stack Overflow question, but I, I love the sub part here. When I see SNES or C64 emulators, it astounds me. It is really easy to get caught up in the technology and, and caught up in the solution without focusing enough on the problem that you're trying to solve. And it's certainly one of my bugbears for this community. And we've sometimes fallen into this trap a little bit with, with our software preservation work. So as the digital preservation community grew, we devoted effort to creating our own emulators, which turned out to be pretty short lived. And in the case of IBM's UVC, just not practical for development or for the users. We were learning lessons, however, and alongside the work of Dioscuri, colleagues at Freiburg were beginning to experiment with methods of simplifying emulation for the end user. By this point, we did begin to see some genuine collection of software, and there's a few examples here, but not always collection for the purposes of preservation and typically hampered by copyright and other legal issues. A number of European countries introduced legal deposit legislation for digital content, but software was not always to the fore in the face of considerable lobby from the publishers. Later in the webinar series, we'll hear from the British Library on the incredible software archive that they only managed to acquire because it was on discs attached to the front of serials or in the back of monographs acquired a non-digital legal deposit. What I haven't listed on this slide is of course the myriad of other software collections hidden away and yet to be discovered or exploited that with a little extra resourcing still have the potential to survive and hopefully flourish. So as time moved on, we started to see more subtlety in approaches to software preservation compared at least to the default emulation centric approach. With game studies finally merging as a serious academic endeavor, we saw interesting alternatives emerging. This is all about capturing the experience of using the software. And I love this paper from James Newman, examining all that contextual enthusiast generated material, and in particular preservation of the game walkthrough, the how-to guides for particular games. And this turns preservation around from a focus on emulation and access to the original to a vital exercise in web archiving. So taking that to the extreme was the Mapstalgia blog, capturing gamers' maps of their favorite games drawn from memory many years after the fact. It's easy to dismiss this as trivial ephemera, but I think it speaks to the emotive possibilities of software preservation. In many cases, we're talking about preserving something far richer than just lines of code. I wonder if anyone else besides me recognizes this map. Uh, N64 GoldenEye fans of a particular age, give me a shout in the chat box. I'm kind of hoping it's not just me. Uh, we'll see at the end. So developing an evidential approach has been a welcome part of more recent work in this field. And here's one example from Ewan Cochrane, who we'll hear from later in the webinar series. Software underpins so much of what we do, and it's vital to consider its impact, even on our most theoretically stable and non-interactive digital documents. I mentioned the forward thinking art and gallery sector, and for me, it's been behind some really groundbreaking work. And this is just one example from Rhizome. Whether you're into software preservation, digital art, or some other aspect of digital preservation, Ben's blog on this little project is a must read if you've not come across it before. So you thought computer games were going to be hard to preserve. Well, I certainly did going back quite a few years, but relatively speaking, they're actually pretty easy compared with the oncoming research software juggernaut, whether it's versioning, referencing, configuration, or just trying to persuade the researchers to deposit while well, virtually their digital souls, this is challenging stuff. And we'll be tackling it in detail later in this webinar series. 
Source code is only going to become increasingly important to research data preservation efforts, but I'll do no more here than trail a series of interviews which will accompany this webinar series, including one where we'll hear from Roberto de Cosmo of Software Heritage. So we'll care for the details on that soon. So to an extent, we've come full circle and we've recently seen technology to leverage existing emulation software and make it work as a practical and easy to use method of access for archive software. Whether it's the maturing emulation as a service work, my friends in Freiburg, or porting emulators to JavaScript so they just run inside a web browser, this work is a dramatic leap forward. Although there are, of course, many non-technology related questions remaining. So at that point, I'm going to hand back to Jess for some further thoughts, themes, and outstanding challenges. Again, thanks so much to Paul for that incredible overview. Um, and as evidenced by that overview, you know, software touches people's lives across domains and sectors. So public health, think about the WannaCry ransomware event that happened in May 2017. Or defense, think about artificial intelligence enabled autonomous defense systems, <laughs> or not. <laughs> or satellites in orbit today. Um, think about the expansion of smart city initiatives that couple software to public infrastructure. And not to mention the fact that CAD-BIM, um, you know, demonstrates how the built environment often begins in a software environment. Or entire supply chains. So to hearken back to um, Anderson's article uh, from, I believe, 2016 at this point, um, which we can point to in the supplementary resources, Software runs engines, it controls safety features, it guides drivers to destinations, powers logistics, and handles the distribution capabilities of many of the largest companies in the world. So looking across the software preservation timeline that, that Paul just provided, there are some general observations and associated challenges that- um, So challenge one, uh, observation one, there were similar conclusions among different project-based efforts. So projects either focused almost exclusively on technological development or they attempted to tackle the gamut of software preservation challenges, right? So ranging from metadata to legal to documentation uh, to collection development policy. Um, and that can be evidenced in a couple of additional examples. So one of the GISC funded efforts around software preservation, which was a combination of, of different things, including Brian Matthews' work around 2011, pointed to the fact that software preservation is truly complex. There are so many things to take into account in addition to just the technical aspects, end quote. Um, quote, because there are so many things to consider, there are inevitably multiple people and perspectives involved, which makes collaboration essential. And then in Preserving Virtual Worlds, which was a study that was done and sort of the final report published in 2010, um, you know, they examined the technical, the legal, and the social aspects of preserving virtual worlds, looking, asking the question of what legal and social issues might impede libraries and collecting institutions from collaborating with communities outside of those organizations on development and maintenance of emulation software. Um, Another observation is that the, the field seems really poised to Paul's earlier point and his sort of illustration and evidence for this, that the field seems really poised to move on this topic a little bit further. Um, born digital access and archives and special collections, traction and professional discussions around data reproducibility. Um, so I think that there, it, mapping that discourse, you can see how changes over time may have loosely corresponded to other things that are happening in digital preservation. So, you know, changes to the legal environment in the U.S. context before and after the Digital Millennium Copyright Act. Uh, again, the growth of the repository landscape, the institutional repository landscape, uh, the, the increase in acquisition or accessioning of hybrid collections, the demand, again, for reproducibility of computationally dependent research by funders, and the shift, as William pointed out at the beginning of the, of the hour, the shift from migration as a favored strategy to documented examples of successful and, um, you know, potentially scalable emulation solutions. So this leads us to a third observation before we dive into the challenges here. So the difference that makes a difference. So several of the final reports from some of the projects that were listed and described 
similarly concluded that when we think about software preservation in the service of accessing our existing digital data, whether that's a simulation of climate change impact on ocean sea levels, or a CAD file from 2000, or we want to play Deus Ex, there are three major software preservation challenges that are not domain specific and cannot be addressed by projects alone. So challenge one, no single institution can feasibly locate, much less acquire or procure all of the software and hardware for things that are on you know, legacy storage or installation media, uh, everything they might need to address their existing born digital data. And the implication from that or a suggested implication from that is that we need a means or a mechanism to coordinate collection development and to be able to share and reuse software collections across organizations. So thinking about software as a collective resource. Challenge number two is copyright culture and digital rights management associated with software that has been distributed on installation media, for example. So um, licensing and copyright, all of those issues are not exclusive to this, but we sort of focus on this because we can talk in future about some specific sort of tax or efforts that are ongoing in parallel that at least get at some of these associated legal issues. So a, a, a suggested implication for this is that we need a means of leveraging our existing legal tools across national contexts. So one of the things that we're pointing to here is that the body of anecdotal evidence, the personal stories that are building from these different parallel efforts, they, they see no borders. So even though the way that you would apply some of those anecdotal experiences and personal stories as evidence towards making a legal case in a particular national legal environment, um, the, the framework is specific, but the stories are not. So that's another way that, that we can think about, um, um, you know, what, what can we do collective action wise in terms of legal, legal progress on this matter, even if we don't share the same legal context and framework. And challenge number three is that as distribution models change, we went from the possibility of preservation and access that comes with having the installation media to software libraries and executables that are squarely and exclusively in control of software producers. So we can't copy what we don't have. And this points to uh, another suggested implication, which is a means of articulating and aligning what those shared needs and interests are that we can say represent the mission of cultural memory and research organizations more broadly. Um, and also to say that, you know, as a sub bullet of that, that that involves a coherent articulation of those broad research and education reuse needs. So that that can be represented in discussions with ICT, um, not necessarily licensed negotiations, but to think about how to incorporate that perspective into the discussion. And then challenge four. So emulation approaches or access strategies like emulation, um, you know, they, they had not scaled until fairly recent years, um, certainly within the 2010s. Uh, and there's also no community um, funding model to support dependencies on third-party emulators. Um, so some of the suggested implications from that are, you know, we know that we already exist in, in an ecosystem of digital preservation networks, right? So, so how do we leverage that to this point of, of scale? And then how do we create a business model that can support in, uh, emulator development when we know that there are a lot of really active and passionate communities, developer communities, um, that are largely volunteer but are incredibly prolific and productive that make this work possible. And then also, again, thinking about what is the mechanism for facilitating distributed preservation, sharing, and reuse of software in configured environments. So what can we do to resolve or 
pieces of this, I should say, and how do we continue to make progress through scoped project-based efforts, but also know that we're moving the needle on all of the key software preservation challenges that are inherently cross-domain and inherently collaborative. So I'm just going to throw this up as a thought experiment. One tool um, that could help us think about software preservation as collective action is to consider what a shared system of measurement could look like. So for example, an action agenda, which I'll click on now. Um, Y'all bear with me while I do this live. Let's see. Um, so while that loads, one, and let me make an adjustment here so that you can see this. Um, so, so one tool that can help us think about software preservation that way is potentially something like an action agenda that outlines what the major issues or areas of activity are and then sort of builds in a phase progression. So where is the field currently, as you can see in phase one, um, in this example, and then where do we want to go? Um, you know, what does software preservation look like when it's when when we feel as a field confident that um, people have what they need in order to fulfill their professional mission, um, which is inclusive of all the use cases that have already been covered. Um, the spaces between phase one and software saved are how we get there. So I think a lot of us have some some ideas about this and spin is certainly, you know, working on building out a version of that roadmap. But I also ask you all to consider through the remainder of the series what you think belongs on this map. Um, what, you know, what are you hearing that needs to be represented on a software preservation action agenda? And with that, I will hand it back over to William. Thank you very much, Jessica. There's plenty for us to be uh, uh, discussing uh, in that space. So I'm going to try and moderate now uh, an open discussion. There's currently uh, just under 70 of us on the call, so please be patient with us. Uh, we can use the chat box for comments. And just to remind you, if you want to come on the microphone, please do uh, raise your hand. Uh, that's in the participant box. And I'm just going to be scanning that to make sure everyone who wants to participate is able to do so. But uh, I wonder if I can maybe ask perhaps a bit of a controversial question, and I'll invite uh, Paul and, and Jess to, to, to reflect on this uh, before we go further. So, it, it, you know, it seems to me, who owns the problem? That's your opening gambit, really, uh, Jess, in terms of the challenges. Who owns this problem? And, and just now, the problem seems to be owned best by volunteers. So there's a volunteer effort owning the problem. And there's... Good examples maybe in the gallery community where there's a sense of ownership of some aspects and there's also evidently something in the research data world, but by and large it's owned by volunteers. And I suppose the controversial question to ask is that is that is that itself a, pr a problem? Uh, are, are big agencies able to, to some extent, shrug their shoulders or walk away because there's such a big volunteer effort behind the games preservation? Uh, uh, how do we turn that... Uh, uh, potential risk into the meaningful opportunity, which I think it probably does represent. But how would we, uh, you know, is there a risk that the volunteers are crowding out uh, a kind of a, a more determined effort from others? Paul, go for it. So, I mean, I, I don't have any solutions, but um, chatting to um, Jason before we started, uh, he yeah. suggested that I was being a bit too polite. So. Um, I, I kind of mentioned this politely in my presentation about perhaps falling through the, the, the cracks a little bit between the museum community and libraries and archives. And um, I, I'll stop being polite. Okay, that's, it's just not good enough. We need to do more. This is such a, a fundamental, important topic. Someone needs to take this on. And all the other digital preservation work that we do in all these other different areas is not going to hold up if we don't nail the software preservation. So. Yeah. It, if we can't even decide whose responsibility it is, you know, something has gone wrong and we need to work to address that. And the yeah. only way I can see to do that is by moving forward. We've got to collaborate. We've got to work together and, and try and find the resource to do it because that's obviously been a, been a yeah. sticking point. Yeah, yeah. So there's definitely a need for people to take ownership. And I can see a message from, 
for Patrick, noting that uh, you know advocating for funders and policymakers to treat software sustainability on an even footing with data stewardship, and certainly that you know it's taken an awfully long time to bring uh, researchers round or research funders round to the value of uh, of data. I guess though, if we're not looking after the software, that preservation of data will itself become something. Uh, you know, we can we can do, but it'll become, as you say, Paul, a little irrelevant or or, or miss the, uh, the bigger uh, opportunity. Uh, I wonder if I can invite uh, some thoughts about uh, the case studies, Paul, that you presented. So you gave us a really great kind of potted history, and I'm almost inviting people uh, in the room to contribute. So I'd be interested in knowing what other great case studies people have. Uh, of uh, software preservation uh, on their desktops. Are there, are, are there things which didn't make your cut, Paul? Uh, or are there other examples that we should uh, be picking up on? So Jason, you've got a, a, the, the, the Mortal Kombat uh, example. Do you want to just briefly talk about that so that people can have some uh, uh, knowledge and context All right, of it? So uh, I, think, I think part of what the problem that people encounter is that, uh, well, there's two, there's two major problems. One of which is uh, the American moving away from physical manufacturing as its primary uh, uh, source of income and growth. And the other one is uh, software being such a generalized term that has yeah. now pervaded all aspects of civilization. Yeah. Uh, meaning that it is very easy for somebody to find any reason whatsoever to turn away from doing it. And that as institutions are starved of resources there's a million reasons for them not to do it. So, you know, the two, the two responses are, number one, to realize, you know, what we've done as a country around making intellectual property our crown jewels. And yeah. the other one is for institutions to perhaps consider approaching it as a niche and getting yeah. so good at that niche that they become part of the conversation in the more generalized term without yeah. having to feel that they have to recreate everything from ground up. Yeah, yeah. I, so there's an, issue, there's an issue there about the unfunded mandate that institutions face because they're just being asked to do this on top of everything else. But if they can address that unfunded mandate and spot the opportunity, then actually there's a great opportunity for someone to, seize, to see something of an agenda here, which is going to turn out to be strategically really important. Right. So to bring it back to Mortal Kombat, right now I'm the only online library you can play Mortal Kombat at, and it's the original Mortal Kombat 2, and what that does is that wedges me into a bunch of conversations and interactions, and it's caused it to be that the archive is known for this in some way, so they become a party and a player. Yep. Uh, but we're not sitting around burning our relatively meager resources into coming up with frameworks or sending me, because I'm their entire software department, to a thousand seminars and webinars and events and rule sets making, and instead just letting us pull in what's, what's being done and, and being part of the conversation without feeling we have to boot it from scratch. And I think that's what happens when, when the people who are on here, I don't know everyone's uh, yeah. pronouns in terms of like where they're coming from or what they're part of, but one of the problems is they go back to their organization and their organization is like, well, we can't preserve all software. And then what you say is, yeah, but you know, we're in uh, we're in Seattle, and that's where Microsoft and Valve are. Why yeah. don't we become really good at preserving the software of Microsoft and Valve? Yeah, and yeah. that puts you in the rest of them instead of saying, "How do we preserve everything?" Yeah, so it becomes a something of a kind of collecting strategy, a strategic response to that collection development on the assumption that not everyone can do uh, everything. I mean, I'm tempted again now, let's put this out to, to discussion for, for other people. I mean, are, th th does anyone have, does anyone want to confess uh, to having a software archive or a software collection uh, in the background? Uh, and is anyone willing to share the contents of, you know, how, how are you on sharing the contents of that collection? I'm sure you all do. You know, I've got a cupboard uh, uh, with stuff, uh, of which I, to be honest, it sits gathering dust, but there it is. Uh, and of course, it's quite useful to have that cupboard when it is actually a physical presence, 
But as software is distributed electronically on the cloud and whatever, actually there's a, a gap opening up between that old software of, you know, the, back in the day when it came in large boxes uh, and the software that I'm downloading now from Microsoft or whoever uh, to run, uh, you know, run my PC now. Uh, William, it looks like we have a couple of comments from um, from our attendees. Josh, oh, yeah. Josh Hogan. Um, Josh, if you'd like to expand on that comment, I think that many people on the call would sort of be interested in your take on that. I'm wondering about responses. And then Courtney has also offered up a comment about the role of existing digital preservation networks in this. Yeah, OK, I'll hand over to Josh. I'm not not on a message. Sorry, um, you're in transit. OK. OK. Well, I'm curious just to build on that. So. And this is this is related to Jason's comments about a documentation strategy, right? Approach where people that institutions or organizations that are focused on, say, to provide another example, Jason's was regional. Yeah. Um, uh, if you think about our existing collective uh, collecting development policy, so the areas of collecting that your organization specializes in, if you're a collecting organization, yeah. Um, so you know. Pratt Institute, you know, maybe thinking about what are the priorities for design software and, uh, you know, a research data management center for astrophysics, like the Royal, Soci the Royal Society for Astronomy. Yeah, yeah. You know, it, yeah. What, are, what are the specific sort of domain titles or, or pieces of software that we can start to stitch together a map? around and what are people's general thoughts and reactions to that yeah so there'll be particular needs for software in for example an architectural archive uh, or uh, uh, potential within research data i see a, a message from patrick do you want to uh, do you want to come in on that yes, patrick uh, i can do that you know in an earlier document i tried to split the whole problem in two parts namely all the software that there is already around and you have to cope with that and we're talking mostly about that and the other part is preventing new software new legacy to be formed which is even difficult even difficult to uh, to maintain later and to preserve later if you don't do a right job from the very start so what we try to do is two things at the policy level we try to uh, make founders aware that you have to take care of software just you have to as you have for data because you can't read the data in 10 years from now if you don't have the software. They are trying to get at that and they are getting to understand that. So then later, hopefully, some funding will follow from their point of view. Um, but the other point is uh, we want to offer, at least for the time being, to Dutch scientists that have created software or just at the verge of creating software to provide them a single route irrespective if they ask questions to the at the science center or ask questions to dance or go to their own faculty on what to do with my software we try to give them a single route uh, for their software which means at the background it might be stored at github there may be uh, a sort of front end it would uh, let's say follow the fair rules that we are trying to invent for software uh, there will be a link to the software heritage archive and all that kind of stuff and that is mostly in the context of preventing new problems that we are dosing now uh, to occur. That was the remark I wanted to make. Fantastic, thank you, Patrick. So I think there's a, a real scope for us to, to find like-minded organizations and to help uh, to foster collaboration uh, between them. And I wonder whether we are also missing a trick by, by getting the software publishers involved in some of this uh, uh, work too, and that certainly I know UNESCO uh, has been trying to develop a sort of code base from uh, uh, of uh, libraries of old software. Uh, you know, it, surely it has to be in the publisher's interest uh, uh, to at least to some extent to be servicing their clients uh, with uh, with some aspect of uh, kind of the heritage of the software. I, if I may still make a moment, I have heard of a, 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 an activity called UNESCO Persist. Yeah. Uh, it still is around, but they don't make much progress as far as I learn. Um, but basically, uh, at that level, that should be the route to address 
let's say uh, the Microsofts, the Apples, the Googles, and so on, um, to at least discuss how to get uh, licenses of uh, uh, already obsolete software uh, to be used later in the context of the software that we are preserving. Sure thing. And I can see a couple of other comments online. Just earlier today, I was talking with uh, Alexander at uh, Swansea University. Alexander, you've got your uh, skeletons in the cupboard uh, as part of your history of computing thing. Can I get you just to say a word or two as to how that collection developed, uh, Alexander? Sure. Can you, can you hear me? Yeah. Hi all. Yeah, thanks very much. This is an incredibly stimulating conversation and it's nice to pick up on what we were talking about earlier on. Um, so colleagues may not be aware that at Swansea University in, uh, in South Wales in the UK, um, we've got uh, a very interesting archive comprising hardware, software and uh, literature books, uh, publications, preprints, all the rest of it that have formed part of what's known as our history of computing collection. We're developing, maintaining and looking to put a lot of resources into and to raise awareness of it as a um, educational resource and, 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 and a touch point for anyone that wants to research the history of our our new world um, which is completely dependent on computing as, as everyone's just been setting out um, yeah so we've got we've got programs written on paper typed up we've got the punch cards we've got the whole the whole history of, of programming if you like from from the early days the conceptual days all the way up to as i said in in my chat uh, boxes as you know i'm sure we've all got these boxes as well i've got my personal boxes but we've got it within the collection we've got the boxes of the cd's from the front covers we've got the cd's burnt by the postgrads we've got the people developing it as pis on research products and everything we've got so much of this stuff and as i say curating that is have a big challenge at the moment just to do a stock take the audit of what we've got which unfortunately well, in the case of cds on the front of covers obviously that that's kind kind of easy to work out what that is especially if you've got the original magazine because it's not always obvious but certainly you know uh, cds and copies that have just been burnt or scrawled on the front of no idea so that is incredibly laborious task to go to look through to find out what we've got and make sure we're not missing anything but the other point that i'd like to make you know is is really around the research data management side of things and it you know it would be a brilliant move if we could get funding agencies to be aware of this um, to to mandate PIs and, and projects to fit, build in digital preservation to bake that in from the get-go um, and likewise I, I'm mindful of a DPC uh, 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 an event last year I think that you spoke out William um, where you, the idea of a pressure group or something along the lines of the previous speaker where we we look for some kind of open licensing for preservation purposes and research preservation uh, around the the software licenses that big the big players like Apple and Adobe and everything make as a matter of course. So that would be really interesting as well. But our historic history of computing collection is really interesting and check us out. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Alexander. Uh, I mean, I certainly uh, we interested in, in, in following that up. I, uh, for me, uh, there's a, a, a kind of question. So we talk about uh, software preservation for research or software preservation for research data that actually this part of me wants to almost move the dialogue on and say this is actually, this isn't about software preservation. This is fundamentally about reproducible science. This is actually about the Enlightenment project fundamentally. Uh, and if we're not making science reproducible, then we're really not making science. Uh, and that's, you know, a, a hard message. And I think that's one that we could certainly take forward uh, to, uh, uh, as you say, a pressure group or a, a wider discussion. But it's going to take us all. It's going to require a lot of activity uh, to bring all that together. Listen, I'm going to pause because we're now at uh, something like five minutes over our due uh, end time. Uh, maybe I could invite any, there's loads of chat, loads of conversations in the, uh, in the, the chat box, which is fantastic. Uh, is there anyone want to can make a final observation or a final contribution from the floor? In a moment, I'll maybe hand over to Jessica and Paul to, to, to kind of give us some final thoughts and then Sarah to bring it to a close. But I'm happy for any late, uh, late Jess, thoughts. Jess, Paul, can I bring you in right at the end for some sort of final reflections on our first uh, webinar? Uh, I, I just want to say thanks again to everyone for their contributions to the discussion. I think that, that that's really at the heart of what we're trying to spark here. 
uh, to reiterate William's comment and, and really everyone's comments on that front. I, I do just want to offer up a question to the group more for thought rather than to, to solicit responses right now. But in thinking about coordination and alignment, you know, maybe contemplate whether or not you could see yourself contributing to um, sort of a body of information about your local software preservation context, whether or not you have some documented workflow where you're just sort of thinking about your software dependencies in your collection, whether or not that might be something of value that we could undertake collaboratively. And then also maybe what are some other shared systems of measurement that we could consider as a community um, in order to align all of the different activities that are going on in different spaces. So that's, that's, a, that's a thought that I'll offer up to the group to consider throughout the duration of the series. Sure thing. I, you were speaking there as imagining almost a maturity modeling kind of approach, you know, uh, the, the NDSA levels just can't get out of my head just now. But that sort of maturity modeling, where are we? What are we doing just now? Where do we want to be? Where do we want to be as a community? And given the nature of the collaboration, we all need to move as a community. There's, there, there's no doubt on that. Uh, so I'll, I'll pass over Paul. Paul's had enough time to talk already. I'll maybe just drop the microphone uh, over to Sarah. Uh, Sarah, you've got a word or two about uh, our plans for the future. This is the opening episode of a series. Uh, Sarah, do you want to tell us what's next? Uh, yes, I can. Um, well, just to wrap up really and say thanks again to everybody for coming to this session. Um, uh, the episode will be, the recording of the episode will be posted on the SPN and DPC websites by the end of the week, um, alongside all of the supplementary resources that Paul mentioned earlier, including citations for the materials referenced today as well. Um, uh, and we'll share the link for, for these recordings by email and Twitter, so we'll get in touch with you uh, again to let you know when those are available. Um, but yeah, to, um, to look forward to next week, episode two uh, will be on software collection development and we'll air at the same time. UK time and Central European time, uh, 8 a.m. PST and 10 a.m. I think it is with you guys. Um, over in the US. Um, so we'll be hearing uh, next week from research and content lead Anne-Marie Trepanier with special guests Patricia Falcao, uh, Tim Walsh and Paula Jablone. Uh, after the whole series is over, we'll, uh, as Jess said, we'll distribute a follow-up survey. So do uh, keep track of the topics that you've enjoyed, would like to hear more about and let us know uh, about those at that point. Um, but I think all that's left to say is thank you again very much for joining us today and we look forward to seeing you next time. Yeah, so thank you very much. Uh, we, should, we should give a virtual round of applause, I think, to Jessica and to Paul for their preserva uh, presentations and for their thought-provoking uh, 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 discussion topics. And uh, I look forward to seeing you all again uh, next week. So thank you. I've done, I'll do a one-hand round of applause uh, uh, for everyone uh, on your behalf. So thank you all very much. <laughs>